Uh, it's always an absolute honor to, first of all, uh, do my best to magnify the Lord. And uh, I don't profess to know everything that God is saying or God is doing. But I understand that as part of the body, we each carry uh, an integral part that's important. All of you carry something that the person next to you has not been designed by God to carry. And it's wrong of you and I to put a lid on that. But it's correct if we allow it to rise, to infiltrate, to influence like leaven every part of who we are. And I want to encourage you guys today, whilst we were um, worship, worshiping, I kind of feel like the Lord is, is unearthing and awakening or grabbing hold of your attention and casting a light upon callings, upon the narrative that he has for your, for your journey, for your lives. And uh, if we give heed to it, if, we, if we're attentive to it, um, it will change your life. It will prosper you in all that God has called you to do. Uh, the, worship, um, the worship was in, incredible, as it always is. But it's a worship that digs deep into the, the crevice of your soul. And it demands an unearthing of the treasures of God in us. It pulls up. We can't worship apart from God because he is worship. And it pulls up that, that dimension of God being worship in us. And it gives us wings to go backwards and to go forwards. Backwards in the sense that it carries us, the worship that you're involved in each Sunday, a worship that carries us to ancient places, ancient pathways, to unearth lost treasures, to capture them, and wings to carry us forward from lost places to a horizon that is screaming at us, come. And there are wings to this worship. There are dimensions to this worship that that God has given you that, that privilege, that honor, that talent, that it needs not to be hidden. And whilst we were worshiping today, I, I kind of was visiting a new dimension for you. And I was seeing the angels of the Lord bring a book that was different to any other normal book but it was fluid. It was adapting to the expression of who you are. It was drawn to DNA and it was wrapping itself around you and clothing you as a people. And I was aware that this book came from the future into the now. And I felt the Lord say, tell them that they're about to start a new chapter, a new chapter in what God has called you to communicate, to lay, to build, and even in dimensions of worship, even in your conversations. And I felt that that chapter is there for you now to begin to turn the page, enter into a different dimension, a different narrative to that which God has designed, scripted, and called you to as a people. And uh, when I was just worshiping there, I was bringing Brad before the Lord and and what a, what a graced leader that you have. He's not only talented on many levels in a creative way, but God's given Brad an incredible dimension to think beyond the current trends. And we need futurists right now that are able to capture because of the condition of their minds and their thinking because of the fluidity of their paradigm, they're able to entertain new thoughts. They're able to see beyond the horizon that's been set for us as a people and look beyond that into the eternal dimensions. And so you have a leader in your midst that you need not anchor him down as a pastor. You need not be a people that burden him and limit him by the title pastor. 
but you need to begin to cause thermal currents underneath his wings and not hold him in as a counsellor. As the one that will always be required to pour the wine and the oil into your wounds. But you need to know what you have in your midst and not allow the traditions that have educated us to lock a pastor into dimensions that are worn out, are burnt out in the kingdom of God. And we need to recognize grace, recognize and understand who is leading us. Because God does apportion a man, a woman, a team to lead us. And sometimes the conflict that happens within congregations is our expectations that we had are old expectations. And God wants us to fast track in our hearts and our minds towards a deeper and a better understanding of how do we serve the type of leader that we have and not bring limitations on him. So many places over the years I've gone to I've seen pastors vexed by their congregations because of the paradigm that they have in their own lives that govern them and foster expectations that that man of God was never meant to walk in. So we need to begin to create thermals for him so that he can rise on those wings that you have been given and he can go back and capture lost things. And he can rediscover things that the church in our journey have been lost, capture the treasures as a wise master builder and bring them into the present. At the same token, those wings carrying us forward as a people in this city, in this state, in this nation and globally. Let us not limit one another. Amen. And so it is a privilege for Christine and I to be here. It's the first time my wife has been with me for a long time. She's been off ministering and doing other things and we've been busy. It's been a, uh, a huge change uh, for us in 2020, yet a change that I wouldn't change a thing that has gone on. And there are a few times that I'll repeat a message. I don't carry sermons. But as a messenger of God, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a teacher per se, I'm not an evangelist, but the prophetic and the apostolic dimension in me requires me to first sit in a word. And for the last five months, I've been sitting in a concept, I mean, sitting in something that I feel that God has shared with me. And, and so I feel I, I had a duty in God to start to break open that word in various dimensions, hence some of the posts that I've been putting out, and then also... Uh, the message today is not a repeat sermon, but I'm going to share what I've just shared recently in another church, but who knows where we'll go in that message. And I want to touch on the concept that God gave me from Isaiah 42 and verse number nine. And the title of the message is new or next. It is a question that God is placing before us today, asking us the question, do we want the new or we, do we want next? And so over five months ago, I think the second day after the new year broke upon us, I was starting to marinate in the presence of God, musing over the Word of God, and God drew me to a familiar passage of Scripture that we're all aware of in Isaiah 42 and verse 9, but He began to break it open. And I want to share some of these dimensions that God has been sharing with me as I believe it is Word for us. Now, before we go any further, please hear this. Prophetic people can be prone to use the word new a lot. I am not a person that is caught up in just saying new for new's sake. I'm not a person that is bound up in just the superficial excitement of declaring new things over people or new for the sake of it. So it's with caution and I believe it's with wisdom that God has placed this word in me and that I want to share it with you today. Don't get caught up in the concept, but receive the invitation of God to come into the reality of what He is declaring in this new season that we have broken into as a people. So verse 9 says, See, the former things have come to pass, or they've taken place, and new things, I declare, before they spring into being, I'll announce them 
to you. Let's do it justice by framing it historically and understand that the context that the prophet was instructed by God to speak this word was a time when Israel or Judah were in captivity to the Assyrians. And when we talk about captivity, we're talking about a mass oppression that caused a robbing of the culture of a people because they're now submitted to a new law. They're submitted to new customs, new culture, new methods and ways that are foreign to them as God's children. They've lost land, they've lost jobs, they've lost rights, they've lost authority, they've lost, lost positions. It's a little bit familiar with what's going on in the world right now. But I love how God is attracted to dark times, dark spaces. Dark as in, this, in the sense that where there's no light or clarity. And he inserts himself with the word of the prophet by saying, behold, former things have taken place and new things I declare. Hence, God used that time as a catalyst to declare, Israel, it's a new season for you. And I believe with all of my heart, after sitting for the last five months in this context, that God wants to use COVID. God wants to use the craziness that is taking place on a political level, on a social level, on an economic level, on every level you can think about, worlds, economies, peoples are being shaken right now. And we have to look beyond conspiracy theories. We have to look beyond the hazardness of what is taking place now. We need to rise above the maze in the journey and see what God is declaring clearly. It is a catalytic time for the church right now to hear the voice of God because God is declaring right now in the midst of this time, I'm birthing a new season into your midst. Whenever God speaks a new word, He accompanies that word with a new season. We get excited. We dance up and down and, and we're so chuffed about the word of the Lord. But more than often, we reject and we resist the new season that comes with it. Excited about word. Excited, excited about possibilities. Excited about what could be. But whenever God speaks a word of promise, that word cannot find its full expression without a God season process. And we must understand right now, we can dance in song, we can sing, we can celebrate in new words that are being released. But the dancing must bring us to a posture of submission and obedience to this season that is shouting change. Because the season brings with it adjustment. The season requires a letting go of former things and an embracing of new things that aren't familiar to us. Hello. And so we understand this reality that God does business on earth only through his seasons. I want you to grab that. Seasons are integral to the workings of God, to the process of God. Plans, purposes, and destinies can't be separated from a season. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1 to everything, it's governed by a season. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that the maturing of all things are governed by a season. The maturation of our lives, livestock, vegetation, everything God created is governed by a season. And in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25, Daniel talks about the season of God, but he says, warning, the enemy's plan, strategy, is to change times and seasons. When Israel were brought out of Egypt, they were on a calendar system that was governed by Egypt. 
It was regulated. It regulated their life for something like 400 plus years. They were conditioned and cultured by the seasons of Egypt. But when God called them out, and I forget what passage or what chapter it is in, in, in Exodus, but he says, this shall be your calendar. This shall be the month that you begin now. This is the beginning of beginnings. The first thing God does is he says, I want you to adjust to my season. I want you to come into my season because outside of my season, Egypt, you can never manifest the promise. So he wants to get into the interior, the psyche, the paradigm of a people that he's calling to himself, for himself to manifest what is in his heart. But that can't happen unless the calendar of God is born in us and we are regulated by the seasons of God. We are governed by the seasons of God. We are influenced by the seasons of God. Most of our problems, most of our anxiety is when we allow the calendar of God to exit from our hearts and the season of Egypt influences us. Amen. And so God has got us in this pathway or trajectory right now in verse 9, he says, former things have taken place and new things, I declare. I was asked the question recently, where are we, Pete, in the journey of God? And I said, we're wedged right now between next things and new things. Right now in the workings of God, in God's economy, in God's calendar, we are positioned right now between next things, former things, and new things. And I want to unpack that. In, 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 in relation to next things, I believe that we as a people, unfortunately as a church, we've been cultured, we've been influenced dramatically by the concept of next things. You look at the, the whole thrust, particularly in the last 10 to seven years, people are looking for the next thing, the next iPhone, the next technology, the next conference, the next church, the next guest speaker. And we can go on and on and on. And it's a clever way of marketing to get people emotionally excited about the next thing. What is the next thing or what is the former thing? It's just a repeat of what was. And if you look and study in Genesis 26, Abram gives birth to this magnificent miracle, this gift that was impossible to be manifest in the loins of Abraham, in the womb of Sarah. His name was Isaac. This miracle child, this promised child, this gift from heaven above entered the earth and the miracle began to journey in the path that God had chosen for him. But if you study Genesis 26, you'll notice that Isaac stayed conditioned by and governed by the boundaries of his father. If you trace the journey of Abraham and you chase trace the journey of Isaac, you'll notice that Isaac journeyed everywhere his father went. You'll follow him when he meets kings and leaders. Same situation, the same circumstances. He didn't do anything new in his generation. Why? Because he stayed within the confines and the limitations of the previous generation. And I want to submit this thought to you. And it doesn't come from a rebellious, but an honoring heart to those that have gone before us, including myself as one that has gone before some of the young guys. The role of a father, the role of a spiritual dad is not to create a rerun, is not to create a sequel, but is to create an open pathway that the next generation will exceed and do works and manifest a dimension of God that we could not do. We are foundation layers. The role of spiritual mums and spiritual dads is always to champion 
and to push budding leaders, people into all that God has called them to and to shout to create force and energy behind them so that they can do new things, not do a rerun, not do a sequel. A week ago, I was watching, the night before I was preaching in another church, um, Rambo. And I love a good old brain dead kind of movie that Rambo put out. Five movies, First Blood, Last Blood. I was watching Last Blood and thinking like, Yes, come on, Ben. I, I got my son down, the popcorn, everything like that. We're ready to watch Last Blood. I said, This is going to be exciting. By the end of the movie, I looked at my son and he'd seen them all as well. And we came to the conclusion First Blood is just the same as Last Blood. It was just a sequel of Same, Same, but different. And I tell you, God doesn't want that. We're right now, when we talk about being caught between next and new. We have done a tremendous job as a church. This is not a put down to the church. I love the body of Christ, but I'm putting out a call right now and saying to you, we've done a terrific job of reproducing next things, but we've done a poor job of manifesting new things. Next, we've manifested new. We are yet to manifest that. But there is something about this present season that I believe that there is a significant measure of God's grace and wisdom to be able to move forward and manifest this new season in God. Let's look at the word new things, the term new things. I don't want us to get caught up in the concept of new things, but to begin to allow a migration to take place on the inside of us, both individually and corporately towards what God is declaring in this season. The word or the, the term new things means this, a significant shift that changes the course the function and the character of something. I'll say that again. It's a significant shift in the journey that we're on that changes the course or direction and function and character of something. Sum it up in two words, game change. Game change. I believe that God right now wants to shift things at that game change level if we're willing. The term new things, I love it, in the Old Testament it's used 53 times in the context of God declaring to a people, I'm about to birth a new kind of people. 53 times throughout the Old Testament in relation to God about to birth a new people. And in fact, the, the, the root meaning or the root of that term new things literally means a name change. So I'll submit this to you, that God takes a Jacob who he wants to do new things, not next things. He takes a Jacob and he knows that Jacob does not have the capacity to change course, to change function. Even at a level of character, he does not have the capacity to hold the seed of promise that God gave Abraham, gave to Isaac, and now to Jacob. Jacob represents a new season, but Jacob had to wrestle. And that whole wrestling is a sign of what is taking place in the season of God right now. There are many Jacobs that God has on a pathway towards becoming Israel. And in the midst of the wrestling that's happening right now, it is only Israel by submitting to the transforming power of a holy God that had the capacity to birth nations, to birth a new breed, a new kind, a new thing that God had in his heart. And I fear that we, by religion, can get stuck as Jacob. Stuck in that vacuum of old character, course, direction, when God is wanting us now to wrestle and not let go until that transforming power is done in us. I love how heaven is attracted to dysfunctional people like me, people that have struggled through and had to overcome depression and anxiety and dyslexia and, and all the list. I had a huge list. And I used to wrestle and say, God, are you sure in your choosing that you want me to do this? 
petrified to stand up and minister at times, anxious. Christine will tell you, I'm sitting at the back going to go out and speak and I'm saying, I can't do this. I don't believe in myself. She'll tell you. Wrestling with Jacob and saying, God, I think you've chosen the wrong person. And he just wants to display his glory. He wants to display his nature in our weakness. He's attracted to it. And so if you're struggling through stuff today, understand that's where you learn to trust. That there's a Simon in you, Simon Barjona in you, but he sees the rock. He's calling the rock. He's calling that out of you. Because uh, Simon couldn't carry his apostleship. Simon couldn't carry revelation that was going to transform the Gentiles. He was standing there and sometimes our old nature starts to manifest in the afternoon when we're on the housetop and God is lowering down things that were foreign to us and saying, rise and eat. And the Peter, the, the Simon Bar Jonah in us says, not so, Lord. And God's saying, behold, I do a new thing. It's not going to be limited to Jerusalem and to the Jews, but I want to take the gospel, the good news to the world and you're the conduit. And Peter had a choice. Do I remain in next things? Do I entertain the concept of, of the revelation that God is downloading right now and just kind of reproduce same, same, but a little bit different? Or am I, am I going to allow what is foreign to my paradigm, which is against ancient law and custom? And am I going to rise? and do what God's called me to do and be what God has called me to be. He said, rise and eat, rise and eat. And we're right now in that juncture. We're in that intersection where I tell you, sometimes we're settling for paradigms that's just a next paradigm. It just, it's just comfortable to what we know. But I predict and I see and I feel in my spirit, the juncture that we've come to is as significant is the isolated times that the gospel, the apostles, the prophets, the pastors and the teachers were building Jerusalem, Jerusalem only. It was, it was significant what, what God was doing. And then when they got super comfortable in their paradigm, God said, now I want this to go to what you classify as the outcasts, the dogs. I want the gospel to go globally. And you, Simon Barjona, who are now Peter, are going to be the rock, the conduit that my revelation rests upon. In order for us to enter this new season, we've got to let Peter come. We've got to allow Israel to rise. But both men suffered with rejection, insecurities, identity crisis and whatnot, yet they were chosen by God. And so are you. Amen. Amen. Israel loved the word. They were challenged by the word come out of Egypt. The moment they were faced with oppositions that seemed impossible, the slave rose up in them when God was calling out the sun. They loved the word, they celebrated, but they rejected the season that was upon them. And I send a warning out to all of us today. We can be just like Israel. We can dance around the fire of God. We can dance around the covering of God. We can celebrate, we have word, we've come out of Egypt and we can remain outside, but never come in. And we can reproduce next things. Israel, we're dancing, we are the next of God, God's chosen, etc., etc. You see, they turned new things into next things because they wouldn't submit their lives to the process, the work that the season accompanied by the word was bringing. I mean, you, you're here today? So new things can't be accessed or entered with old paradigms. So where are we now? Let's backtrack. Let's capture something because I want to I want to submit to you these thoughts. We're talking about we're in between next things and new things. We can reproduce next things. We've done that well. But are we willing to submit to the transforming process of God by His grace and by truth that's breaking forth into this hour and manifest the new things that God wants us to manifest? 
So we're in an overlapping season right now where one season, former things are dying off. They're not as valid as they used to be. The methods that got former things to the place where they were are no longer valid and the methods need upgrading. The technology is being changed as we speak today. You see, one season doesn't end. When God declares by his prophet, behold, former things have come to pass, new things are to declare, it didn't happen immediately. But that word begins to butt up against the former things, the former season. And that's what creates tension. You see, when truth is released, even when a prophecy, a genuine prophetic word of God comes to you, you're excited about, about it, but it will create tension in you before it will manifest the pro promise of God. Because all truth creates tension. And as that word of truth comes, it will begin to challenge the former things in your life. It will begin to challenge the comforts, the knowledge, the understanding that got you to where you were. And it will challenge your comfort zone. But the design of God is to be established in present truth. So we have to know what is current in God's mind, current in the season of God. John the Baptist said this, or sorry, Matthew eleven twelve 12 says this, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. I was raised uh, in, in the 90s, kind of around the whole charismania, Pentecostal mindset that, you know, we were to scream our heads off in warfare because that was really taking the kingdom by force. So we would scream at the devil, we would bind, we would loose, and we would start to wrestle and say we, we were taking the kingdom by force. And then I started to gain a bit of understanding and started to read that scripture in context and started to understand that the time of the writing of this has nothing to do with screaming at the devil and prayer. But he's saying this, that when John came on the scene, he was carrying truth that would be a precursor, a foreword for the truth itself to manifest. He was laying down foundation. He carried a new season. And as John, from the days of John the Baptist, to the present time, Jesus was saying this, there have been two seasons vying for dominance. And that's what's happening right now. I'll submit this thought to you that I believe that while we are looking at principalities and powers, maybe from a historical point of view, maybe a lot of the tremors, maybe a lot of the shakings that are happening in the earth today is not necessarily the power that we tend to give the devil over nations, but maybe it is a manifestation of two seasons colliding and vying for dominance. Maybe it is two chapters starting to contend with one another because God's narrative is manifesting in a time where people are struggling to catch up with the story of God. Are you hearing me today? When we look at a, a, um, a weather system, when there's a frontal system that's coming, it's because of two movements colliding, warm air and cold air. And when those two systems start to hit up against each other, they create a front. And that front manifests itself through tension, storms. It unsettles things within the region or within the area that is under its influence. And I want to submit this to you. I believe that's what's happening right now. That we've got two movements that are contending, that are clashing, that are shaking the very core of what we've known as in former things. And they are trying to vie for dominance. And God is looking for paradox. God is looking for you. God is looking for somebody who might be Jacob, who might be Simon, but he's looking for somebody to not only give voice to it, but to enter it. Jesus says, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, for you have shut up. What are they shutting up? They, are, they have shut up 
the reality of a new season. They've shut up the reality of truth that he was carrying. They shut up the kingdom. And God wants us to open up the gateways, open up the pathways, open up so that his truth for this season can manifest and we can be established in it. So how do we know in the midst of two seasons trying to vie for dominance? How do we know that if God is wanting to shift us? Number one, we, have an, we feel unsettled, if I can say it this way, we start to feel unsettled with status quo. No longer are we finding contentment with the way we've done things, the way we've operated, but there's an unsettling within us. The second thing is we become disconnect, uh, discontented with what, with what once moved us. What once caused you to get excited and you wanted to celebrate, it now causes you to feel discontented. It can be your job. It can be circumstances, relational circumstances. That doesn't mean we're throwing everything away, but God is unsettling you because he wants to reposition you. Thirdly, you have a deep sense on the inside of you, there's gotta be more. Number one, unsettled with status quo. Number two, discontented with what once moved you. And number three, a deep sense that there's got to be more. Right now, God is wanting, as I've come to a close, the word of the Lord to break into Samuel's heart. Samuel was caught in a time where two seasons were, were waging a warfare, where Eli, the Eli company, the Eli priesthood were corrupt in their ways. And there'd been a series of judges that were ruling the land. And Samuel the boy, who breaks protocol, who is not from a priesthood family, but is outside of the traditions and God says, this guy is gonna carry my mantle as a prophet and he'll usher in kings. Now hear me now. And three times the word of the Lord comes in the context of the former things. Samuel. Samuel. And three times he runs to Eli. Why? Because his paradigm was wrapped up in former things. Eli had the word of the Lord in his mind. It was Eli calling me. But it wasn't till, I love this word, it says here in the scripture in 1 Samuel 3.10, then God came and stood before him exactly as before. But listen to this, calling out, wow, Samuel, Samuel. Because God needs a Samuel right now. And Samuel answered, here's the language, it changes. I am your servant, ready to listen. I am your servant, ready to listen. The word listen then is the Hebrew word shema. And it means this, I'm ready to be obedient to what you're saying. God is looking for right now a people, married couples, a community, church that will Listen at that Shema level. I'm not just hearing so I can get blessed, but Shema has moved me to a place where I have been caught, captured by the season, the tone, the frequency of your voice, and I surrender to it in obedience. The Shema of God is breaking through. So what do we have to do as I close? Four quick points as we prepare to go to barbecue. What's required of us? Number one, capital R, repentance. Right now, we need to be moving in an attitude and a mindset of repentance. Can I submit this thought to you? I'm not against people coming to the altar, crying out to God and repenting and beating their, 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 their chest. There's no problem. But repentance is not a moment that you visit. Repentance is something that we must carry in our journey with God all the time, 24 seven. Because repentance, metaneo, literally means I'm willing to let go of what you said is no longer valid and I'm willing to reach forward towards the things that I don't know yet, 
but I'm pressing. Like Paul said, I'm forgetting my theology. I'm forgetting the things that brought me as a Hebrew scholar to where I am. And I'm reaching into revelation to truth to discover Jesus. That's repentance. It's not a moment. It's not a conjuring of the emotion. It is a lifestyle, repentance. Number two, we need sensitivity. In other words, we need deep awareness with what God is declaring in this new season. Awareness that there is a new thing that God wants to manifest. Number three, we need flexibility. A willingness to adjust to the new things. It's a process. Jacob had to adjust to Israel. Simon Barjona had to adjust to Peter. Abram had to adjust to Abraham. Sarai had to adjust to Sarah. We're catching up to the new thing that God is declaring for us. Finally, as we close today, above all, we need focus. Clear focus on the primary objective for this season, and that is new things. We need to be focused on the bullseye. God is declaring new things. I submit this again in repeat. I'm, I, I'm not trying to stir you up to just get caught up in the concept of new things, but I believe with all of my heart that God is declaring, I don't want to do next things. Former things are finished. We don't want to rerun a sequel, a repeat in your life, in this community, this state, this nation, and globally the church. God wants to declare a manifestation of new things. It's a process. I'll submit this to you. I might not see the fullness of new things manifested while I'm alive, but I want to be a bit of sand to agitate so that the pearl can be manifest in the purposes of God in this time. It takes voice. It takes somebody to say, yes, I want to be a conduit, conduit for new things. Could you stand to your feet, please? Thank you very much. I just want to pray for this uh, young man. Are you both together as a couple? You married? Just come and stand over there if you wouldn't mind. Thank you, Lord. Just right there, that's your spot. It won't work if you come closer. <laughs> Hold hands. Thank you, Lord. I was looking at you whilst we were worshipping today and this word dropped in my spirit for you that you are uh, carrying within you the Lord's compass. And so God is orientating you, not only as an individual, as a couple, but God is setting your headings. God is setting your direction because there is a mighty call upon you guys. There is a strong calling that, that, that God is wanting you to, to, to capture. And so in the midst, I saw the comp compass uh, needle starting to to Christine, just come. I, I saw the needle starting to adjust and, and I asked the Lord what that meant and I felt like there, there are decisions that you guys are gonna be faced with in this next couple of years that be careful that you don't make the wrong decision because it's crucial that the decisions you make set you in the narrative, the story that God has called for you both to carry out. The call of God is rich. The call of God is strong upon you both. And what is in you is going to be so uh, impactful upon the previous, sorry, the, 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 the new generation that God is releasing in the earth. And so there is a call for ministry. There is a call in the marketplace. You're going to be part of a new breed that cross over uh, the, the, the boundaries that have been laid by former generations. You're going to carry something that is going to be strategically new. But you carry a heart, the heart of God in you. And there, there, is, uh, there are hours of prayer that have gone on, this intercession that you're carrying, this, this travailing that's on the inside of you. And that's turning everything in your nature and your character that's breach. And so it's not only you praying for others, but it's adjusting. It's, it's causing that compass heading to be adjusted so that what is on the inside of you is aligned and married to the heart of God. Because there's a Davidic expression in you. There's a Davidic calling upon your life. And so like David that was highly favored, he was favored for others. Favor shouldn't be used upon ourselves, but favor is always for other people. And you both are gonna carry an incredible favor. And my sister, God has given you creative, 
creative dimensions that are deep within you. And there are going to be concepts and ideas that, that, are, that are going to rise in the chapters that you're moving forward that are going to create wealth and going to create business opportunities within you. And so these things are going to carry such a new fragrance and a new uh, DNA that's going to capture market uh, spheres and places. And so I see the two of you not to worry about finances because God is going to guide you in, in steps, in directions. And so there's this catch up that's taking place in you both right now. But just rest in the reality that the hand of God is strong upon you. And the hand of God is moving you forward in this time. And so we say yes and amen to you both. We believe in you. God bless you. Uh, the, the guy here, um, yeah, is it? Oh, Jude, what a good name. It's my son's second name. Uh, Jude, when I look at you, I see you up to your neck in mud. And then I was looking at you and I was wrestling in my mind, is he in quicksand? Is he, is he being restricted at this time? But I felt the Lord say, no, I've called him to the mud of the earth. I've called you to the mire of the earth. And God is going to use you as a rescue boat to reach deep into the mire that uh, is going to capture hearts, it's going to capture minds, and it's going to turn lives towards God. There is a huge calling on you. There is a, a dimension of evangelism in you that is being birthed, and it's, it's going to generate a a, uh, an influence that's going to go uh, across our state into the nation and into certain nations. And there's this music sound on the inside of you. And there's this music tone that when I was worshipping over there, I, I was seeing music symbols coming out of you. And so you're going to be a fisherman, a funky fisherman, that will capture, will capture an audience that's kind of been lost. And part of that is in the music dimension. Part of that is in writing, in creative writing. And so there will come a point where you will run mentorship uh, training uh, platforms and, and you're gonna influence the young generation. But there's a smartness about you. There's, a, there's an academic dimension to you that God wants to use and display His glory through. And so I see you teaching, and I see you lecturing, and I see you training, and I see you capturing as a funky fisherman some of those that have been lost by the church. And so today we release that. Sing, because your voice right now, I see that hand of the angel of the Lord coming around about you. And I see the Lord putting in you kingdom lozenges that are soothing sounds that are gonna come out of you. And you're gonna produce albums and you're gonna produce uh, songs and sounds and rhythms that have been lost. But there's part of the wings that will take you back to capture lost treasures so that you can manifest that which is in the sound and the heart of God. Does that mean anything to you? <laughs> Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. While you're there, I just want you to stay there. I don't know why, but just stay there. I felt that there's someone here, probably a couple of you, that uh, you, you have considered, um, uh, what do you call it? Not actors school, what, what is it? Theatre Theater and the arts. And it's kind of in you, but the lid has been on you. But there's this dimension in you that kind of needs to be awakened. Who is that? Okay. One, two, three. You can stay where you are because I think it'll work. I just want Christine to pray through that, that, that artistic dimension because I kind of feel like for, for some of you, that, that pathway God is opening up right now and you to say yes to it because your influence is needed in that dimension. 
but not only influence. I, I want to say this, and I don't want you to hear me the wrong way. Sometimes we think everything, evangel- God, God's putting me in this sector for evangelism, but he also wants to take your talent and display it and be the best you can be in his name. Amen. So get Christine to pray. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Just come, those ones that feel like that is on them so I can just get a feel for you as well. Yeah, I'm glad you're coming because I really got pulled towards you. And I'm, as I turned towards you, I really felt this is significant time in God for you. It's like a Kairos moment. But it's also a Kairos moment for you. So humbly I come before the Father for you and the dear one with her baby on her. That's okay, you're part of this. Father, these ones with their humility and their, their hearts that are stayed in you and in your presence right now. I feel like the Father is just wanting, um, I know I've got to pray for you and I will, <laughs> but he is wanting you to fix your face firmly on him that he would manifest himself and his glory and all his, the, the, the magnitude of his glory will be seen in the creativity that you have and the dimensions of expression in that. Father, I just thank you that even as they firmly fix their minds and their creative hearts on you, I declare that they will become a conduit. Father, I'm praying for these ones right now, that Father, your glory will be seen through them. I see a humility of heart in them. And Father, ones like the new generation, the next, Lord God. Father, yes, Father, we've even heard the message today. The next is the, uh, the, the replaying of the things of past, but the new is that which is now. And Father, that you could birth forth even upon these ones and in these ones, those new things. You are the new generation. I lay my hands upon you and I speak upon you the release of new things in Jesus' name. Father, upon the beautiful lady with her child, the release of new things in Jesus' mighty name. Upon you, my dear sister, humility, functionality, beauty, grace, dimensions. There are many that will come through you and to you, that they will be seen because the advancement of the kingdom is in them and through them and for them and with them. You're going to see many daughters come to the fullness of expression because of your belief since system and their belief in them. I just see many coming to you and submitting some things to you and you saying, that's not a problem, you can do that. And because of your belief in them, they're going to soar and go through you and go beyond you. You're going to be a mama in an in, in early age. You're going to know those ones that are called to you as sons and daughters and they're going to rise and call you blessed because you believe in them. See the potential and form the potential and release the potential in them and through them and for them. My sister, I just see your face being, um, it's like on uh, an expression of uh, when I looked at you, you're on and being seen and you're, you're going to be able to dig deep into the, the work of the Lord, the word of the Lord, and your voice is going to be heard. And I just see nations hearing and seeing you and calling you to themselves. You're one that is a visionary. You're the one that is a hope and a way maker. And I just see that there are many waiting for you just to stand and saying, I will stand up and be a voice because there has been a sense of no longer going to hold that, put a lid on that and not allow myself to be that voice. But God is calling you to be his voice, his, his, his mouthpiece and many will, will be even set free because of that beautiful sense of the aroma of Jesus as you come into their homes, as you come into nations, but also Place, there's a place for you for a significant leadership role and you're going to be seen, you're going to be uh, called upon to speak, to preach, 
to teach the Word of God. I just bless my sister in Jesus' name. I thank you for the call, the call to nations, the call to many people, and many are gonna be blessed because you're gonna become a voice, a voice. Write the things, make it clear, the dreams of your heart, the desires of your heart, when you come into the presence, whatever is on your heart. God says, I just feel like the Father's saying, go girl, go girl, get on with it and just rise and become the beauty, the beauty of his glory on earth. Because you're like an Esther. You're the new Esther being manifest and released. And we just pray a blessing and a shield around you and a guard around you that the harassment of your soul will be no more in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. In this atmosphere, we could go on all night, but you would miss the barbecue. <laughs> Listen, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, a frog could preach and be anointed in this atmosphere. And um, what, a, what a privilege it is for us to join with you just for a moment and to share some, some thoughts with you guys. Um, we pray for you. We stand with you in this wild journey that we're on in 2020 and uh, declare as I close today that all that God has intended for your life will come to fruition because of your willingness to say yes. Amen. Thanks.